I figure if we're going to come to uh, the Royal Geographical Society, you might as well pull up your old geography report um, <laughs> and just sort of set the tone. I actually only noticed this tonight, quite ironically, that my geography teacher was called R. Scott. It's quite, <laughs> <laughs> quite, quite appropriate. Um, and I guess the good news was for me as a kid, um, I was super curious. And that curiosity has driven me to really follow my, uh, my, my sort of curiosity to understand nature better and how ultimately we tell better stories on behalf of nature. And that's exactly what the plastic he did. But I'm going to run a quick movie first. So I'm late, I've been a uh, crazy day. Come on, come in, Pier 31, home of the Plastiki. Ah. I think the first inspiration for the Plastiki was really stumbling across this report that the UN had put out about the fragility of our deep oceans and the accumulation of marine debris. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, I'm reading a report about this human fingerprint, this eastern garbage patch which is floating uh, ominously in the Northeast Pacific. And so here it was, this amazingly disgusting kind of manifestation of modern consumerism swirling across our oceans, yet it wasn't being discussed. So after seeing this and being inspired by this, I decided how could I try and, and, and create an energy that would solve this. The dream started as um, you know, very simply saying, could I build a boat made entirely of plastic bottles to sail across the Pacific? And from that sort of curious notion, um, the, the adventure began. That was back in 2006. Three years later, we are now getting close to putting her in the water, which will be a pretty momentous day. But it's been so far a phenomenal journey of understanding, exploring, learning, unlearning, relearning and sharing ideas to create a vessel that will showcase waste as a resource, will, will hopefully highlight the fact that maybe it isn't plastic that is to blame, but it really is our inability to understand the material, how we use it, what we're using it for, and more importantly, how we dispose of it so that it doesn't end up in our oceans. I think the takeaway message for the skimmers is let's just beat waste. I think if you really want to get involved you start to look at it and say let's make waste a resource and you start to reduce, reuse, recycle but obviously rethink. And finally if you're a real diver and you want to get really involved in the plastiki, you fundamentally start to change your perception of your role on this planet to lessen your human fingerprint. And that doesn't just mean with waste, that means with our consumption of natural resources, that means our use of energy, our use of water. It means understanding that as a species we are totally dependent on the vitality of our natural environment. And without that, we cannot live on this planet as we know it. So that was um, actually shot before we left, um, and that was probably 2009 when we shot that. Um, and we'd been going on this project for um, close to sort of two, three years. And I think a lot of people always ask me, how did it start? And as you heard, I was reading a UN report, and a lot of what Simon's just discussed was, was unearthed for me in this report. And it was a really sort of, sort, of, sort of hit on the head moment. It was one of those things where I was like, this is unbelievable that we've got this human fingerprint, yet we just are not connecting with it in any way, shape, or form. You know, it, it really sort of, to me, highlighted the fact that we had sort of externalized ourselves from nature and created this human fingerprint. And this image was really probably one of the first images that I dug up when I started doing research that probably inspired me the most to start thinking about a bottle bow. And after taking this image, um, we kind of, in our organization, Adventure Ecology, we work um, on a thing called the equation of curiosity, which is a really kind of simple equation that basically says in this room right now, we've got a room full of dreamers. Um, kids tend to dream a little bit more than adults, but we have a room full of dreamers. And those dreams percolate adventures, those adventures percolate stories, and those stories inspire more dreams. And that whole equation is pushed through by just asking questions and, and challenging the just that's the way we've done it mentality. And that's exactly what the Plastiki was about. It was that simple notion of could we build a boat made entirely out of plastic bottles to fundamentally give the ocean a voice. 
And it's just started in that very basic premise. It was nothing more than that. Um, and I remember thinking to myself that, you know, here we have this sort of symbol, this, this, this you know, luckily you don't have them here. Well, we've got one there hiding down. On the yeah, yeah, here we go. You want some? Put it up there for a... You need oh, some. I'm, I'm all right. Okay. <laughs> yeah. um, we, we have this sort of symbol of really kind of what I call dumb single use, throw away, planet point one zero consumerism. This really crazy thing that we're doing is where we're producing products not aware of where they start and where they end. Um, and it's kind of ironic to me when you start to look at it that actually the very word polymer, if you split it in half, is many oceans or many seas, um, which I th think is kind of interesting when you look at the word um, that we are now seeing, as we've just heard, these incredible plastic human fingerprints turning up in our ocean at a remarkable rate. And it's not just as the media have portrayed it as one sort of location, as you've heard just now. It's multiple locations. It's in basically encompassing our entire ocean. In 2007, I was sort of sketching and we worked up. This was actually the first manifestation of the plastiki ever. Um, this crazy looking double decker. I don't know what I was thinking by putting people up in little things. And, and it's really funny to sort of look at it. But this was where the dream became the adventure. This was the first sketch that we ever did on what the plastiki may look like. And these big barrels were, again, taken as influence from that photo, those big barrels of bottles that we had. Um, it's quite fun to see that we actually put bottles in the cell, and then the actual cell that we used was made of post-consumer PT um, bottles. So actually, it wasn't that crazy. And I think that's a big part of any adventure, is actually you know, throwing it out there and starting somewhere. And by taking that first step, it created this incredible sort of curiosity. Um, and I think that... Um, Another sort of part that came into it for me throughout um, the sort of design phase was really understanding that this was a value perception. This was a story perception. Buckminster Fuller is a genius. I mean, he had it so pegged far before any of us started figuring out we had all these problems. And I think that's at the point where I recognize very clearly that this couldn't just be like that guy walking along with his bundled bottles. It had to be something that was aesthetically inspiring and pleasing and something that we could actually look at and kind of question the fact, was, was that really waste? So this became a, a, a challenge around stories. It became a challenge of what was the narrative that we wanted to create? What was the narrative that was going to inspire people to sort of learn, unlearn, and relearn? So that the very heart of the plastiki was innovation. Most people focus on the adventure. When do you leave? I heard that a lot. When do you leave? When do you leave? And when you leave, everyone says, when do you arrive? <laughs> when do you arrive? And you're like, shut up. <laughs> we'll get there when we get there. We had no idea. It was a long journey to figure out when we left. We quite auspiciously left on um, the, the actual spring equinox on the 20th of March, almost bang on it. But innovation was at the heart of this. And that's what this project was about. And it started out very early on with an architect called Michael Paulin. And we worked with Michael. Um, and he was involved with the Eden Project. And I asked him. We were sitting on a panel. I said to him, have you ever designed a boat? And he said, no. And I was like, perfect. You're my man. That's exactly where I want to start. I didn't want any preconceived ideas. And we um, basically came back, and he came back to me and said, look, I've got this idea. It sounds crazy, but a pomegranate might be a really good place to start for designing the hull and using biomimicry, nature-inspired design. And it kind of flowed from there. And what was really important for me with the plastiki was that it was a hotbed of curiosity. There was no wrong answers. We didn't know all the answers, and we definitely didn't know all the questions. And what that did was it allowed people the chance to throw out the most extraordinary ideas. And it's nice to see, um, obviously, a lot of my team here. Um, Jason, sitting second row back, he can put his hand up and wave, um, is an incredible person who was involved in this project. And again, this was one of the ideas early on, floating solar panels. It never came to fruition, but it highlighted the fact that we could start to actually innovate um, you know, and, and think outside of the box, and there was no right or wrong answers. And some of those, um, you know, didn't come to fruition. I should jump back. This is a glue that we created, which was based on cashew nuts and sugar. Um, here's actually our first skateboard made out of the material that we um, have been working on for the project. So a lot of stuff met, never came to fruition, um, but it's out there. And that was a big part of this, was actually allowing ideas to percolate. As you can see, this was some of the early sketches, this crazy looking pond skater. This was sort of how the bottles would stack together in that very early stage um, of, of trying to kind of put these sort of almost trusses together and wrap the whole thing up that quickly. Um, was taken off the table once a naval architect had a look at it and laughed at us and said, you've obviously never been to see that thing will break apart pretty quickly. Um, so we went from that sort of early sort of pomegranate inspiration to this vessel, which was our um, prototype. This was the first thing that we built. And as you can see, we had all the bottles 
um, spaced out. And actually, you know, this was a design by Andy Deval, who's an amazing naval architect. This was the sort of, it didn't really vary that much from this. But the one big thing that you'll notice here is obviously it's not made entirely of plastic. And this was at a point in the project um, where, you know, we were really struggling to figure out what was going to give us the longitudinal rigidity we needed in the vessel. And I think it was at this point that we started to change our own story about plastic. And it's very easy to just point and say, that's the problem, and vilify it. And that has been the environmentalist sort of, I guess, slant for so long, is to take that sort of knee-jerk reaction and run with it, and vilify plastic, and say, that is the problem. And at that point, when we were trying to figure out what material we could use, we really were struggling to find anything that sat within the ethics of the project, that sat within our ethos of cradle-to-cradle -cradle design. And we started sort of saying to ourselves, and I remember speaking to Matt, who's the expedition manager, I said, look, we need to go out and stop and pause and go and find people who are using plastic in a smart way, people who are actually engineering it to have a second life, third life, fourth life, a closed-loop material, something that is not going to just end up in the landfill. And that was a massive tipping point for the project. It was a big, I guess, gamble on our behalf because we didn't know whether or not this was something that would come to fruition, but we knew we had a dream, and that dream was already creating an adventure that was so strong now in the, in the narrative that we had to make it happen. And so we went out, and this was one of the early pieces of plastic that we um, got. This was an eco-lumber, eco-board, eco-timber. There's a big market for this now, crushed bottles pushed together. It was, you know, on the website, you know, presented as amazing material. Um, we'll build bridges and houses and retainer walls, and this was after 20 minutes of it sitting on four crates. And we just went, <laughs> oops. <laughs> I was like, damn, that's not going to work. Um, again, you know, it was um, definitely... Um, one of those moments where the project was sort of on, on tender hooks and maybe not working. And that was at the point where I guess we just stumbled upon, upon um, a group of crazy scientists out of uh, Denmark who were starting to tinker with self-reinforcing plastics. Plastics that had already been around since the mid-80s, but there really wasn't any marketplace for them. These are plastics that basically, very simply, use their own matrix, their own material to support themselves. So, um, you know, similar to a leaf, let's say, it, it doesn't, you know, take lots of different materials. It doesn't take bark and other bits and pieces to make it, its construction up when it, it, it's a single, it's a, it's a mono material. And when it obviously falls off the tree, it can then obviously become nutrient for the tree and it's a closed loop material. So this was a self-reinforcing plastic. And we didn't really know, again, where we'd go with it, but we, we, we recognized that we would have a go and we started tinkering in our lab uh, or in our kitchen, in our rental house, and much to the... Um, you know, the, the disgust of the landlord who got very angry when these wafts of plastic started wafting upstairs into his apartment. And finally, we created a, you know, enough of a structure to say, we can make this happen. This is going to come alive. And you know, again, the material is now being developed further. This is the first um, fully recyclable surfboard fin in the world um, and now can go from being a surfboard fin into maybe another board or something else. So from that point, the adventure began. And, and we could start building. And we assembled this incredible team. And it's amazing. Joe down here, the skipper, waving away um, the plastic and other folks who are here. Um, you know, we, we were able to set sail, as I said, on the 20th March on this amazing voyage across the Pacific. And I think, for me, for the, for, for the journey, it quickly transpired to us about, you know, understanding that we, we really were the message on the bottle. We really were you know, as that point, we, we recognized that we had created this incredible story. We needed to use this little spotlight that we had to kind of create this global audience and try and drive the conversation. So I think we focused very clearly, um, you know, at a base level and started to identify what I call single-use dumb plastics. So we really focused in and we were very lucky to have Imarsat um, as a, one of our our technology satellite partners, which allowed us this unprecedented sort of connectivity so we could constantly hit people with this, you know, bombardment, really, of just like, look, there's probably four or five main items ending up in our oceans. And the one we identified that we said people should focus on are the plastic bag, the styrofoam cup and container, um, the, the, the lids from the plastic water bottles, and um, the plastic water bottles themselves. And those four main items, all of which we come into contact with every day on the trillions. I mean, when you go into the stats, I was saying to someone today, it's quite funny, you can actually make up the stats on plastic, because I don't think anyone really knows. You can just say, oh, there's a trillion plastic bags thrown out in Japan last week, and people go, oh, wow, that's nice. Um, it's, it's, you know, you just, it's one of those things. So plastic pollution was what we tried to do, is really change narrative and say, it's not marine debris, it's plastic pollution that we're seeing in our oceans, because the majority of the stuff we're seeing in our oceans is plastic pollution. 
We have seen this image before, but what you might not have seen is when you take it apart and you pull out the plastic. This was inside one baby albatross. Again, reinforcing what Simon was saying. And if you look in there, a lot of the stuff is red. Red bits of plastic. They mimic krill, shrimp, things in the ocean. The albatross comes down, sucks it up. There's simple things we can do. Why not saying to Coca-Cola, ban red lids. Make them a different color. No red lids on plastic. You know, starting to think about small things. Can the plastic lid be attached to the container so it doesn't come apart when you go for recycling? Um, the other thing that we wanted to focus on in the narrative, and we only touched upon, and, and Simon only touched upon it, I guess was the fact that it is far more ominous than people recognize. It's subsurface, it's molecular. You know, plastic photodegrades, that astonishing fact that every bit of plastic that's ever been produced all the way back when the first fully synthetic plastic with um, Bakelite in 1907 and presented in 1909 came out, everything's somewhere. And so these little flecks are now getting into the food system, and that makes it personal, and I think that's what we tried hard to do. And the final piece that we did with the plastiki was more about you, and saying that the plastiki really was trying to stand as a metaphor for change, what you can do as an individual, because all of us can do something. And although we live in a society that's more automated, more packaged, more detached, and maybe sort of, I guess, um, in some ways, you know, more disempowering than ever before, where we feel we're maybe kind of lost. There's big cracks appearing in the fundamentals of society nowadays. We, as individuals, have the incredible capacity to make a difference. This started one silly idea and then started to percolate and created a dream that became this incredible adventure. So by the time we arrived in Australia, this was what was meeting us, this incredible image, which scared the shit out of me when I saw it. <laughs> Hi, <laughs> I need to leave. Um, and, <laughs> and, you know, in the end, the plastiki percolated and, you know, we spent over, you know, 100 odd days at sea and 8 odd thousand miles. We had 12,000 blog stories. We had a huge impact. And today, people all around the world are contacting us saying, we are starting to create our own plastiki as a metaphor for change. And we are trying to change a story about waste. And that's what this was about. And that's what today is about. The dialogue here is about changing things. So only apt to finish on a Bucky quote. Um, you never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete, which was what he said. So I sort of tweaked it a little bit, because I thought you can, you could do that. And basically said, you never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a boat that makes the existing model obsolete. Thank you. <laughs>